seen in November sale is opportunity. Really excited about the changes we've made to the Horses Racing Age portion of the sale. The timing of the Horses Racing Age section is really well suited to the industry. It allows us to build for the future, and the future is bright. The future is bright, it came in November. Good morning. It is 11.20 Sunday, November 7th. This is the TDN Writers' Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm so glad we had daylight savings last night, so I had an extra hour to stew over that nonsense in the juvenile turf. I am Bill Finley, I'm correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I might be the only one in the world who didn't bet modern games. You know what, like everybody says they were there for Willie Mace's catch. It's that kind of thing, you know, okay. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And I was so pleased that uh, one of the horses that won the Breeders' Cup race was actually named after one of the co-hosts here. So congratulations to, the, to Bobby Flay for naming Pizza Finley, <laughs> winner of the juvenile, no, pizza. Oh, so that was my only good bet of the weekend. So you're not going to take that from me. <laughs> pizza Joe Bianca. Congratulations, Joe. You nailed that one, actually. Actually, all kidding aside, you know what? Our picks were really, really good. The three of us actually had a lot of winners. A lot of chalk, though. A lot of chalk. A lot of well, like we said, it, you know, more chalk than you know, blah blah, fill in the blank. But yeah, but we definitely hit a lot of them. Pizza Finley. <laughs> Did you guys get your lanes in glasses? No. Oh, you didn't get your honor AP lanes in class yet. Where's the swag. Wow. Yeah, I got the Honor AP Lane's End. I got the Darley Vest. Wow. And the best race of the week. Who sent you all this stuff? Well, life is good. I've had this shirt. When I turned 50, they gave me this shirt. Oh, okay. But, but, I will change right now. Out of this shirt. <laughs> but whatever, whatever you change into, make sure you have a second one for tomorrow. I'm <laughs> Trying to help the brand over there. <laughs> and, and the brand appreciates it. Pizza yep. Bianca. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Take part in the Keeneland November experience from November 10th to November 19th. So that starts this week. You can learn more at november.keeneland.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are super thrilled to welcome to the program from USADA, the CEO, Travis Tiger, and the director of the equine program, Dr. Tessa Muir. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Yeah, it's awesome. Really, really glad to be here. Yeah, thanks so yeah. much. Really excited to be talking to you today. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're so flattered that you guys have come to us to kind of release these, these new rules. So basically, let's start with a broad question here. Why are you guys here? <laughs> what, do you, what, what, yeah. what, is, what is the overarching news here that you guys are making with these releases? Yeah, well, well thanks for having us. It, you know, it's great to, great to be back. Wonderful to see you uh, three again. I think it was a few months ago. I, I, I went back and looked at it. I think I had a full beard at, at the time. So we're uh, making our way, you know, if not, we're vaccinated out of the COVID crisis. So we, so we appreciate, um, you know, the chance to be back. And it's wonderful to see you all. Listen, I, you know, as I said then, we're honored to have been asked to play a role. You know, we're, we're here now because the rules um, that we've been working on with the authority under the new legislation are being released um, for public comment for the first time um, on Thursday. And, and we're, you know, just um, honored to play a role. You know, I've described it this process as like the triple crown for the industry um, to, to really change and return the sport of horse racing to where it once was. And, you know, the eyes of the globe can be on it, not just, you know, the eyes of the FBI, frankly. And, and that's a wonderful thing for all of those who love horse racing. The, the first leg of that triple crown is, as you all know, we talked a little bit about it last time was getting the legislation passed and there were, you know, a, a bold leaders within the industry of course, some people there that were opposed to it, you know, who were fearful of change or, you know, had success in the mediocre program now or just wanted the status quo to remain um, for various reasons. And, and look, they're probably still going to be opposed to it as the, the legislation now is enacted and the program is starting to be rolled out. But that was the first leg. And you got to give a lot of credit to, you know, the Jockey Club, to Woe, to the Strawnack Group, to Churchill Downs, the Breeders' Cup. I mean, the list goes on. 
of the folks within the industry that stepped up to get the legislation passed. I think the second leg of, of the effort and the Triple Crown is the rules themselves. And that's why you know Thursday is such a big day and that the rules through a, a pretty long process up to now are being published for public comment. And what I can tell you is we're, we're really excited and, and frankly, really satisfied that the rules are headed in the direction of putting in place a gold standard program for the industry here in the United States, which is awesome. The, the third leg of it is the implementation of those rules. And, you know, we still hope to be involved with that. If the rules end up in a position that we can stand by, um, you know, we, we hope to, to, to be there with the authority, um, but that's still to come. But, that, but that's really the main um, purpose of us being here today and, and want to, you know, make sure people appreciate what those rules are and the significance um, to the industry of, of those rules. Um, we're going we're gonna to get into all the specifics, but I just wanted to ask a question, a follow-up question, mainly to Tessa, since you have experience in the racing industry at the BHA and in Australian racing. Who have you guys consulted with within the U.S. racing industry along the way to come up with these rules in this process? Yeah, well, we've consulted with um, a lot of people. Obviously, there's um, industry experts on the Anti-Doping Medication Control Committee. Um, last week, I was... Um, at the Breeders' Cup, so getting an opportunity to speak to a number of vets from all different areas of, of America. And, you know, I, I've obviously known people within the industry um, here in the US during my time at the BHA in Australia. So we've certainly spoken to a lot of people and got their feedback and, and hope to continue to get that as we move forward too. Yeah, and, I, and, and really important, I mean, process-wise, um, and I think we've provided a, a timeline for you all. And, you know, if you show it on the screen, you can see, I mean, a lot of, un, you know, hard work has happened and a lot of progress from our standpoint has happened from the authority, right? It, the law just got enacted in January. The authority was selected in May. Um, the, the staff, the CEO was hired in June. We met with them for the first time in July. And to now, you know, just a couple of months later, have gone through an elaborate process. There were 27 industry groups that were provided the rules, they gave feedback on the rules. Tessa mentioned the committee that has, um, you know, industry people directly on it, experts within medication control laboratories and from a state racing commission standpoint, the authority itself has, you know, four industry um, designated experts on it out of the, the, the nine people total. And there's been a lot of revisions to the rules during that process to get it to this stage. Um, so we feel like there's been, you know, ample um, and plenty of, of industry feedback. Of, of course, we're still looking forward to the next two rounds, because as you'll see on the timeline, you know, publication to um, the public today on Thursday for um, feedback, you know, we'll consider that along with the committee and ultimately the authority. It's their decision what goes to the FTC. But then the FTC has another pop public comment period. You know, it's way more bureaucratic, frankly, than we like and that what we're used to in our world with human sport. You know, it's usually the sport decision makers get in room and decide uh, along with the athletes what is best pro process. But but we're happy um, with this process and satisfied that it'll get us where we need to be and heading in, in a direction where, you know, we would be willing to stand by the program. And let's just hope, you know, it's not diluted or in any way gutted. Um, significantly or material changes in the final rules that, you know, we, we're certainly not going to stand by a program that we can't stand by, um, but we don't, we don't think that's going to happen. We think it's headed in absolutely in the right direction. Uh, this might be a question for Tessa if she wants to uh, jump in or Travis. So rather than you saying rule one is this and rule two is this and rule 475 is this, um, what are some of the major changes that racing will see under these new rules vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the rules are now. Yeah, let me, and let me just jump in and then I'll let Tessa chime in as well on some of the more specific issues if you want. But I, I would say, and you know, I've testified in Congress numerous times about what goes into an effective anti-doping program, sort of the, the elements of an effective program from a rule standpoint. And I think, you know, again, this these rules incorporate those elements to it, and, and they're pretty straightforward. One, it's you know a uniform and harmonized 
national program. And particularly in this sport, it's incredibly important because right now there's a myriad of different rules from state to state. And what happens in one state is different than another state creates confusion and people don't trust a system that creates confusion. Two, it's it's independently implemented. And these rules call for an independent enforcement agency. Now, that may be USADA, that's us, or it may be a different agency. That's sort of the third leg of who ultimately is going to uh, independently implement them. But that independence is absolutely, um, you know, important from a fairness and a consistency standpoint. Number two, number three, well-defined violations. So I think we talked last time, you, you, you guys asked me, hey, can you bring a case if you don't have a positive test? Well, in some states today, I don't think that's even possible. Under these rules, yeah, you look at Article 2 of the rules, and it identifies about 12 different types of violations. Only one or two of those includes a positive test. So possession, trafficking, um, complicity, attempted administration, retaliation against a whistleblower. Those are things that can be an anti-doping rule violation or medication control violation that would result in a sanction. Which, which leads me to the next element, which is, is effective sanctions. And I think you, you'll see um, a graphic that we've put together, but is embedded in the rules, basically Article 9 and Article 10 of the rules, where it's a certain period of time that we think are an effective deterrent. They're fair in situations where someone is not with an intent to cheat and may not have the same level of fault. And so we've made adjustments for that. And then I think you have to have a fair process. And you look at, again, there's an infographic, I think, um, that would show the results management process, but you see due process being afforded to anyone that's been accused um, of a violation um, can go through various levels of that legal process to have not not USADA making the determination. We'll be there to present the evidence and to seek justice for the rule violation, but it will be independent people, stewards for you know, secondary minor violations and out of a national steward panel and then arbitrators for the more major consequences in any situation where aggravating circumstances may be argued. And then there's a, an appeal or review process by uh, an administrative law judge and then ultimately uh, 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 the FTC. The last point I'll say is transparency. And we've always prided ourselves here at USADA on being open and transparent because we firmly believe that's the only way you can convince those that you're asking to follow these rules to support what you're doing. And so who's tested and what's tested for after the fact, not before, because you can't compromise and let people know they're going to be tested, but that can be posted. Notice, as you see in the results management infographic that was provided, notice will go to the authority, State Racing Commission, if they want it, the owner and the trainer, if someone has been accused of a violation, whether positive test or otherwise. And then even the hearing process by the arbitrator in major cases can be open to the public if the arbitrator decides um, with certain restrictions put on it. But that, that's how you gain the trust of those who are subject to these rules um, is, is those elements being included. And, and we're thrilled that they are included in, in these rules. Obviously, education and then funds for research to continue to advance the science are fundamental elements. They're included where they can be in the rules, but those are more of a program um, arena. Sorry, anything you want to chime in on? I think I, I think Travis probably hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, the key one for me is that uniformity um, and harmonization and the and the independence that we bring. Um, I also think that um, when people people look at the protocol. Um, in a lot of ways, things are maybe presented slightly differently to what they're used to. But there's a lot of similarities when you when you look into that and you look at the prohibited list um, to the current ARCI model rules as far as the sort of the principles and things behind that. Um, something that people you know may jump out to people is the the concept of whereabouts and um, with the out of competition testing, knowing where horses are is absolutely critical to being able to test those horses at any time. Now, we totally appreciate that that's, um, you know, a, a burden, um, a, a burden that I think is 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 light compared to the, the risk of being cheated out of, you know, purse money because a horse is getting beaten by someone who's who's cheating. 
Um, but that is a burden and we, and we completely appreciate that um, and realize that with, with the whereabouts, there's going to be a need to have good technology solutions that make it as, as simple as possible for people to be able to um, administer. Um, and also that that's going to need to be a sort of a transition and a phase in. And that's not going to be um, one of those day one things that's 1st of July next year. You've got to file whereabouts for every horse in your care. And I think we've you know said before, and I think it's really important, this isn't going to be day one, everything absolutely rolled out gung-ho. Um, 18 to 24 months for us to sort of build this program and sort of reach that gold standard point where we can all stand and, and be really proud of what we um, at USADA, what the industry has done um, to, to, to secure horse racing's future um, in, in the US. Oh, that's great. So, so guys, um, I, I own horses. So walk me through the, the process of one of my horses that gets entered into a race at, at Gulfstream. We'll just use that as an example. And we, the horse is coming in from Palmetto's training facility. OK, so it's not an actual racetrack, but it's a training facility that's accredited and and that horses you know, can come in and um, breeze on that racetrack. They get approved and they can come in and, and race there. So my horse, um, you know, Bing Bong comes in from Palmetto's and goes into the, you know, one of the barns in the back of Gulfstream. What goes on as far as the, the testing, the pre-race testing, the post-race testing? Um, you know, can you give our audience an idea of like, what would happen from step one, step two to step three? Yeah. You want to okay. Sure. So um, I guess the first point of that is once um, your horse ping pong becomes a, becomes a covered horse, um, he or she may be subject to out of competition testing, um, even if he's at the training or she's at the training facility. Um, once you then ship into the, to the racetrack again, if it's uh, before race day, then, you know, again, you may be subject to out of competition testing there. If it's on the race day, similar to what you probably experience now with your horses, there is the uh, potential for pre-race testing. Uh, one of the key things um, in pre-race testing is, is the TCO2 testing, so the blood samples that get collected. Um, your horse obviously then uh, runs and may be subject to testing post-race if it's if it's called for testing. And um, yeah, so it will get urine or blood, um, maybe hair um, taken at any of those points. So it would be fairly similar in that sense uh, to what you probably experience now with the exception of potentially an increase in the out of competition testing. And, and would you say that if a horse was coming in from a training facility, they would be more likely to be, to be pulled and have more um, additional testing or is it just completely randomized from, you know, from the get go? It, it's I'm, not random. I mean, we, we, we don't random. use, yeah, we, it's funny in our Olympic program and athletes used to ask this all the time. Well, you know, is it like the lotto that I see pulled every Wednesday night where right. they ball out and they keep pulling them out and that's who you test until all the balls are out and you dump them back in. Not like that at all. It's very, it's very, what we call intelligent testing, um, not random. Some call it smart testing. Some call it target testing, but we use, we use data. You know, it's interesting the the point, you, you know, the comment you just made, we've heard from a lot of people in the industry that, oh, the horses never leave um, the track or the training facility. And if they do, that's indication that, you know, they're out doing something that they shouldn't be doing. So those are for sure things that if you're in our shoes, you monitor and, and, and look at the whereabouts, you know, in the cycling case, the Lance Armstrong case, for example, all the cyclists on U.S. Postal lived in Girona, Spain during the peak training season because Spain didn't have an effective anti-doping system. And it was really tough for us to go into Girona, Spain and test. So th these are things that are not any different in horse racing than they are in our human sports. And our programs are designed in order to you know, prevent those and, and certainly not you, of course, right, but prevent those who may be attempting to you know, hide their horse to dope them up. So they when they then show up, gain an advantage and and cheat um, betters and other competitors on race day. You know, you, you, you talk, you know, I don't know if you want to finish, you know, the sample taken would then be shipped to an independent, not under our control, uh, a, a laboratory, but that laboratory would have to follow the new standards that the authority ultimately put out. And then that laboratory would analyze those samples. And then those results would be handed back to us and then we would provide, you know, notice of the negative test result to you um, so that you would know. And then if someone else had a positive test result, 
it would flow through that results management process and the rules that are outlined would apply to those individual cases. Travis, you talk a lot about investigation being a big leg of this. It's not just an anti-doping testing. You know, it's not just about testing and banned medications, it's about investigations, about intelligence. So can you take us down that road and talk to us about how the investigation and intelligence arm of this might work? You know, whether or not you guys have the authority to help increase security at some of these racetracks. There was a there was a story that Bill did recently a couple months ago about the jockey club using speed figures to track potential cheaters, trainers that are moving horses up a, a bunch off of other trainers. Can you give us some of the facets that you're going to use to help increase security, increase intelligence, increase investigation yeah. when it comes to the yeah, and, and, and Joe, thank, thanks for the question. I mean, it, it gets a little bit to the program side of it, not necessarily the rules side of it, but really importantly, the rules allow for you know evidence that can be gathered legally to be used in the process to hold people accountable. And I think that's really important in having a good set of rules that you know you can you can legally use evidence that you properly obtain. And, and that evidence, I mean, and again, the rules, I mentioned the um, protection for whistleblowers that you can't intimidate, harass, or retaliate against someone that comes forward. You know, it, it takes a community to protect the, the environment. And so now there's protections for people to be able to come forward and pick up the phone. And look, I, I can tell you, we don't even have jurisdiction yet, but we're all getting calls from people who are pointing us in directions and providing evidence that we're having to, you know, sort through and that could be valuable evidence. I think I mentioned last time when I was here on, on your show, we had in our human program close to 500 tips that came to our play clean line. We've now rolled out a text version of that that we just announced a few months ago that will be incorporated. If we're running this thoroughbred horse racing program will be incorporated into that program as well. So, so all of that is critically important. Having the right type of people and properly trained former law enforcement, federal and state to vet those tips and that information, and then properly follow up on that information, whether it's target tests based on it, whether it's, you know, following up directly with racetrack security or, you know, having cameras or other types of um, opportunities to obtain evidence, asking people to sit down and, and be interviewed. And there is obligations under the rules for covered persons to cooperate with that kind of investigation. And the authority has subpoena power. So the, you know, obtaining documents or other records could be part of it. Obviously, looking through veterinarian records um, that the authority has under the act has access to can also aid in that part of the process. Um, but really putting a, a close eye on um, the evidence that, that is generated to ensure that you know people aren't using just the fact of a negative test. Or you, you guys saw in the Navarro indictments, I mean, they were talking about how the stuff they were using wasn't detectable by the labs. And, and that's what the cheaters do. I mean, we see that in our world all the time. Um, and so you have to have other means, what we call, again, a non-analytical positive, so not necessarily using a traditional positive test may not have any scientific evidence. Typically, there will be some scientific evidence, but coupled with, you know, those traditional buckets of evidence that you see on Law and & Order and, you know, NCIS um, every time those shows run. And, and that's what, you know, we, we've built our program around here at the United States Anti-Doping Agency on our human and Olympic um, or our UFC and our Olympic Paralympic program. And really don't see it any differently for our equine program if we get to that stage. Uh, Travis, you uh, just touched on this, but I want to bring us back to drug testing. And we all know that there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of medications that people can use and they will not get caught because there's no testing for it or no means to catch them by the drug test. Will you guys, uh, I guess, uh, to put it very simply, do a better job catching these drugs than the current system? Listen, I, I think the, the inconsistencies in the current 11 labs, um, some are doing a, and trying to do a really good job. Some don't have the funding to do a really good job, um, but it's clear there's going to have to be good, um, robust, scientifically sound standards that all samples are analyzed by. And, and, and what's also clear is some labs aren't doing a good job and they're not 
being paid at any reasonable level to be able to do a good job. Um, so that's going to be um, an issue. The, the other point along the that same line of thought, the rules um, do account for the opportunity for what's known as an athlete biological passport or equine biological passport. So you just mentioned, you know, hundreds of substances that are out there. Some labs may not be testing for them. Currently, maybe there's not a scientifically valid test for those substances, but what we have built into the rules, and, and it's not there yet, but we're also pushing the, the equine science and research to eventually get there. And other parts of the world are doing some of this research on an equine passport where you can look at the biological markers of an equine athlete through the samples that you collect over time. So you're not looking specifically for the direct drug, but you're looking for the impact of any drug on the horse's metabolism and their bodily functions and, and, and um, parameters. And, and that in our human world has become a, a game changer to a large extent. If you remember Lance Armstrong in his Oprah Winfrey television interview said, the introduction of that program in cycling is what caused him to stop um, doping. I think he went other ways to try to defeat it and got caught, but it was a significant game changer in the world of cycling when it was introduced at the time. And, and we're hopeful, again, science has to get there, but we're hopeful that with the concerted pooled resources and a determination to get the science there in a real way to have real impact, um, that hopefully we can get there. Yeah, and I think the Kentucky um, Laboratory are, are doing a lot of good work on the biological passports. One other thing that I think we probably haven't mentioned yet is also um, the ability to do retrospective testing, so putting samples into storage. Um, and then when you develop new tests in the future, um, being able to bring those samples out of storage and actually then analyze them with the new methodology for those prohibited at all time substances, so the ones that should never be there, um, to look for those retrospectively, um, you know, that that's also a great deterrence to people using things where they say, well, well, you can't detect it. Um, but in the future, when those um, technologies and the capabilities are, you know, enhanced and changed, well, then we can go back and you will still be subject to sanction under the rules that were in place. I have a question for Tessa. You know, the, one of the big things that happened in the last year that I think kind of even brought this issue to light even more was the Bob Baffert, Medina Spirit drug te positive drug test for betamethasone at the Kentucky Derby. You know, I think outside of racing, people thought, oh, well, that's a juiced up horse on steroids. That's why he's, he won the Derby. I think people within racing know that 21 picograms over the level is not why Medina Spirit won the Derby, but that's what gets all the headlines. Meanwhile, like you guys are saying, some of the drugs that actually are harming horses and actually are changing the results of races can't be tested for. Can you speak to maybe some trainer out there who is using legal therapeutic, therapeutic medications that's maybe concerned that they're going to, you know, test the slight uh, amount above the, the legal threshold and then get lumped in with some of the people who are actually really trying to skirt the rules? Yeah. And obviously not not specifically talking in respect to that case, um, but concentration of a drug in a sample doesn't necessarily relate to the effect that it has on the horse. So that's just a sort of a, a general principle. And I think when we're looking at those and one thing that when we got some feedback on the rules we looked at was the difference between a doping violation and a medication control violation. And I think that that's a, you know, something that we really worked on getting some of that initial industry feedback on the rules. Of course, you can also misuse or abuse those therapeutic medications. So um, they can be escalated through aggravating circumstances to a doping violation but one of the things that we've worked hard at is to, to look at that, to, to sort of give a bit more clarity around those potential mistakes that might happen um, with the therapeutic medications versus the deliberate attempt to gain an unfair advantage over your competitors by using either doping drugs or misusing and abusing therapeutic medications. And I think the one other thing that's really important is, although there is a bit of a distinction there, um, we've got to remember that those therapeutic medications also have that potential uh, risk to the, the health and welfare of the horse. So the potential for those um, catastrophic breakdowns and also to the long, you know, detrimental to the long-term soundness of the horse. So whilst it's important to be able to treat horses uh, responsibly at uh, their athletes, you know, they, they need to be cared for. We've got to remember that we've also got to, to ensure that we're, we're doing the right thing by the horse um, for both its 
current um, you know, health and also for its long-term soundness because it, it spent the horses spend some of their time in racing. They spend a lot of their time after racing um, in other careers. So that's really important too. And and just to you know to put a further point on it, the, the rules again that are out take that in consideration and define certain things as medical control violations versus anti-doping violations. So we're totally sensitive to that issue and appreciate it. In addition, the sanctions that flow from those types of violations based on the substance and the nature of the violation can be entirely different. One may be two years for an intentional cheating situation or possibly aggravated to four years or prohibited at all times. It's an intentional cheating situation versus, you know, um, a, a public warning or a, a reprimand or a, a fine if it's truly a, a genuine mistake. Now, multiple genuine mistakes get treated more severely as they as they obviously should be. And, and, you know, while I think this industry blurs this issue way more than other industries, we're, we're sensitive to it. And it's not something that we're unaccustomed to dealing with because you can look at our Nike Oregon project case um, where two co- a coach and a doctor were suspended for four years. In large part, the culture they created was using, you know, otherwise acceptable medications for health in ways to, you know, dope or, you know, um, misuse and abuse those medications to get their athletes to the starting line. And what we know is, you know, racing, whether human racing or horse racing is not an ailment that justifies a misuse or abuse of even a legitimate medical therapeutic to, to get someone to the starting line. And so we get it, we deal with it in our human world as well. And I think most importantly, the rules that are being presented today sufficiently and, and, and absolutely account for that in, in a fair way. And, and Travis, you mentioned before about how some of the labs are underfunded, and that's why they're, they're not uh, up to snuff. Um, the $100 million question, how is this uh, program going to get funded? What's the mechanism? Is it going to be a tax? Is it going to be a per race um, per diem that, that, that owners are going to have to pay. Cause I think Tessa, you mentioned before, you know, it's, we can all kind of give a little bit in as long as we know that it's a level playing field. We don't mind, you know, paying a little bit to know that, that it's, it's a fair race all the time. Who's going to pay for this? Yeah. They, I mean, it's an authority question really, but what the legislation says is the authority has, um, the ability to, you know, go to the States through the state racing commissions or directly to those who participate and compete in those states. So um, listen, I, what I would say from a cost standpoint um, is that the, the industry really can't afford not, it, not to put in um, good rules in a, and implement a good program. Um, you know, I think the large majority, 85% of the costs will be laboratory costs and the collection costs, which can be currently um, you know, in control of the laboratories at this point. Obviously, they've got to meet the new, meet the new standards, and we'll see what the costs are when when those new standards are put in place for the lab analysis. The collection costs on race day, you know, ideally we're relying on state racing commissions, um, but you know, some of those costs could be you know reduced. We're hopeful of. There's other areas that we think there will be some economies of scale, like you know, for example, having um, you know a lawyer in every racing district who prosecutes a positive test, you know, if you can consolidate that in one um, program, like we intend to do, if we're involved with the program, I think you can, you know, shrink in those costs because you have the trained expertise in order to do it. But, but I also look at the numbers in the industry, right? And I mean, the numbers I've seen horse racing um, industry overall, 4.9 plus billion dollar business. We saw um, the Breeders' Cup this past weekend put a an announcement out that they had a 182 million um, up five in handle up five percent um, in large part. You know they had the largest number of foreign horses and the the market over in um, Asia. I think Hong Kong in particular, you know, got behind or maybe Japan got behind um, betting because of the horses that were there in large part because of the medication rules they put in place. I, I got to think the drugs that owners aren't going to have to be paying for now. You know, we've heard the term from industry insiders veterinarians have turned into needle jockeys and they're giving horses 
drugs because that's the culture that exists. And maybe they're legitimate therapeutics and maybe they can justify racing as an ailment to get them to the start line. But but my hope is overall, there's some savings in the overall you know, industry when it comes time to putting in a program. That said, I think the industry has to put in a good program because we know the legislation passed in large part because of the existential threat that was out there to the industry. Um, and it can't afford not to put in, I, I don't think, a good program that really restores it to the prominence that it once had. And, and particularly, you know, if I'm an industry leader and I'm not, but I look at, um, you know, the betting situation in other sports. And if I were, you know, someone involved with the betting money, I would be pretty nervous that now, you know, you can bet from your couch on the NFL, Major League Baseball, all these other sports that are open, that are transparent, that have good rules in place. You know what you're betting on. Here, it's a different scenario. And so the offering becomes a lot less attractive when it had the monopoly like it did just a few years ago. Um, so I, I, I think the, the time is now. Obviously, Congress agrees. And, le and let's hope this can get done in a real way to provide the kind of meaningful change that, that I think has to happen in order to restore this, this sport to where it once was, and, and frankly should be, because it's an awesome sport. Travis, in the response to an earlier question, you distinguished between, quote unquote, dopers and people using therapeutic medications with overages. But you also said something to the effect that uh, if you have too many overages with therapeutic medications, that might be a red flag as well. I hope I summed up uh, what you said accurately there. So what about the Bob Baffert situation? Uh, can you give us an overview of it and how might have things been handled if USADA had been there on day one when Baffert started running into all these problems? Yeah. And, and let me, you know, I, I, we're not involved with the specifics of the case. Obviously, I, you know, know what I know from following the news on it, but taking it out of that context. But let me give you some principles from the rules um, that, that may, you know, be applicable in any case that comes up like that. One, there's the opportunity to um, provisionally suspend someone. OK, and that means they're not allowed to compete or have horses compete in other races until the violation that they have is finished. Now, it's optional on secondary type offenses. So something like an overage on a butte, it would be optional, but it's still a possibility. If it is put in place, importantly, the person who is provisionally suspended would have the opportunity to go to a provisional suspension hearing and have an independent arbitrator decide if there's probable cause to keep that person from competing. Also, the rules have the ability to expedite a case. And so, you know, I was pretty stunned to hear that the Kentucky case this weekend hasn't been resolved yet. Um, that, that's not going to happen on our watch. I mean, that's crazy that it's taken that long to get to um, a final resolution, particularly when someone's competing the entire time. And, and it's no different, again, in our human world. I mean, we have an athlete test positive. We had one of our early cases in 2002, the Jovanovic case, um, uh, a bobsledder. We got the initial case, the appeal done within 10 days of the Olympic Games, because there's no way we're going to allow an Olympian representing the United States show up at the Olympic Games and compete with a pending positive case, just not going to happen. So, so then your question kind of asks about the multiple violations. So, you know, the rules are very specific. You know, if you have a minor violation, a secondary substance, right? Like a, a butte, a legitimate medication that you have an overage on. First of all, the, the risk of the overage is on the person who um, provides the drug and it should be documented well on records that are obtained to support that it's truly an innocent mistake. Um, and in the legal process, in, in quick fashion, we'll get to the bottom of that. But if there are multiple minor offenses, secondary substances, you know, those, those add up. And at four, that then becomes a major violation, which is punishable up to two years. So, you know, this idea that you can rack up minor violation after minor violation, which seems, again, not specifically talking about any particular trainer, but is a comment we've heard throughout on 
the way those state rules work um, is just not going to happen under these rules, and, and nor should it continue to happen, in our opinion. So Travis, does that mean that everyone comes in with a clean slate once you guys come aboard and doesn't matter what past history people have? Yeah, that 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 is uh, according to the act itself, is that anything that's happened, um, whether final violation, final adjudication, a result or something that's pending or a violation that hasn't even been brought yet um, will not be factored in um, to our effort moving forward. It, it, it still stays within the state's jurisdiction. Um, and you see how various states are dealing with some of those um, types of issues, whether certain tracks are going to allow them to compete or not. Um, you know, that unfortunately can still happen on anything prior to the effective date of, of this program. I think it's important, though, to add there that, um, you know, there's a lot of this information that's public, publicly available. And uh, where we talked earlier about, you know, target testing or, or risk-based testing, we, we can still use that um, publicly available information from pe people's previous records to sort of direct how we conduct our testing and, and, and sort of how we target and, and, and direct direct tests. So it can't be used in, in reference to the, the sanctions and the results management, but it can be used to inform um, our test distribution plan and our program going forward. Okay, good. Oh, wait, just, just to follow up on that, how about the tips? You said that people are giving you tips, but you don't have jurisdiction yet. Does that all go out the window once the act goes into effect or no? Well, if the if the if the if no new violations, I think I think the legal term is I'm, I'm going back in uh, the cobwebs. I think the legal term is ex post facto. You you can't be held accountable for something that wasn't uh, you know against the rules of crime or against the rules um, when new rules come into effect. So. You know, while the evidence we certainly can look at and review and use if new uh, violations of our rules, once they're in effect, don't happen when they're in effect, then, then we wouldn't be able to use it. But certainly, um, you know, any any evidence that leads us to, you know, uh, discover evidence of a violation when the rules are in effect would be you know allowed to be moved forward on. All right, so great stuff so far. Uh, we appreciate Travis and Tessa being very, very generous with their time. And uh, we'll be right back after a couple of messages from our sponsors. The TDN Writers Room was brought to you by Keeneland. The Keeneland September Yearling Sale produced six winners during the Breeders' Cup. Nick's Go, Aloha West, Life is Good, Golden Pal, Corniche, and Echo Zulu. A couple champions in there as well. Uh, Keeneland sales grads also swept the top three spots in the juvenile Phillies with Darlene Alcibiades winner Juju's map and Tarabi following Echo Zulu home. And the Keeneland November sale starts Wednesday, as I said. Uh, the book just became available for the Forces of Racing Age section, which is on Friday the 19th. So it starts this Wednesday, November 10th. John, what's your plan? I'm actually uh, leaving Joe on Tuesday to head down to, to Lexington. I'm planning on looking at a lot of mares in book one. Um, some mares in book two, and then also see if I can get a sneak peek on some of these horses of racing age um, that's going to be the following week down at uh, at the Keeneland sale. But um, I couldn't be more excited, not only because I haven't been to Kentucky in two years, but what better destination site than Keeneland um, when you're traveling down to Kentucky? Absolutely. And as Keeneland sales grads continue to produce on the track, we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. The November sale is a destination event for buyers and sellers around the world. The ambiance during the September sale was incredible. As we move into Keeneland November, I think people will find a new experience, a new atmosphere, new optimism. Anybody participates buying and selling. When they participate in Keeneland, they're reinvesting in the industry. That is the mission. It allows us to build for the future, and the future is bright. The future is bright at Keeneland November. Spites Town. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town. Race the way. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Jerkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific it repeats itself. Echo Town. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Congrats to Coolmore with Golden Pal in the Breeders' Cup Tur Sprint. I think one of the most impressive winners of the weekend got a 107 buyer. It's popped out to the front. Never looked like a loser in that race. He's the fifth horse in Breeders' Cup history to win two different 
Breeders' Cup races, back-to-back years too. Uh, they talked after the race about bringing him back as a four-year-old, saying to Royal Ascot, so that's very exciting. He was also the 10th grade one winner for Ashford superstar sire Uncle Mo. Um, unfortunately, Jack Christopher on Friday had to scratch, but he's a horse that we're definitely looking forward to seeing in 2022. Sky is the limit for him. And also Air Force Blue making some news over the weekend. King of Dreams was another stakes winner for him in the showing up stakes. And it was the second stakes winner in 24 hours for him after Astronomer won the Golden Mile Stakes at Del Mar. So Air Force Blue coming on as well. All right, so we're back with Travis and Tessa. Uh, just a couple more questions. I have a question about sanctions, and I think we focus, we tend to focus a lot on the sanctions of trainers because they're the absolute insurer, they're the responsible person in this scenario. But I think there are other people that facilitate cheating in racing, namely owners and vets. You know, one of the problems that we have in racing is there are certain owners, I won't name any names as much as I would like to, uh, that when a, one of their trainers gets busted for drugs, they just jump onto another trainer who is very obviously cheating and then will jump to another trainer. Um, I know less about how, how complicit the vets are. I'm sure Tessa would know more than me about that. But what do you guys have anything in the rules that would also deal with the owners and the vets as well as the trainers? Yeah, I think, I mean, the first thing there is that um, when the horse is in training, the the trainer is going to be the the ultimate insurer, you know, strictly liable for a positive test. Um, but obviously out of competition, if the horse is going back to the owner, the owner could also be potentially the, the responsible person. Uh, when the horse is in training, um, the owner, the veterinarian, anyone else involved with the horse, they can be held accountable if they're complicit and part of um, a, you know, a doping or a, a medication uh, issue, the strict liability of the uh, the, the positive test um, doesn't apply to them. So the, a slightly different um, way that that is is prosecuted, but um, they absolutely can be held accountable under these under these rules. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the you know responsible person um, is held strictly liable for a positive test, where other people, owners, um, vets who treat the horse, um, if they knew or reasonably should have known of the possible violation, um, you know, the, the administration of the drug um, in violation of the rules, then they can also be held accountable at the same level. So we think that's a really important aspect um, to avoid exactly what you talked about. And, and most importantly, you know, it's not just the trainer training the horse that has responsibility for this culture of, of clean sport. It's everybody within the sport should have a responsibility to ensure that it's being done the right way. And guys, one of the things that you mentioned before is that hopefully these new rules will come into effect July 1st, which, which seems daunting, uh, quite frankly. It's like 200 days away if you if you really you know uh, narrow it down. Um, and then on top of that, you have a couple of racing jurisdictions that are actually against this, uh, you know, against the new rules and have actually implemented lawsuits. Um, is that going to affect the start date of July 1st? So I think, you know, obviously we talked earlier a little bit about those who have been fighting and obstructing uniformity um, in this industry going back before the legislation was passed. So it's unfortunate that they filed the lawsuits that they did, in our opinion. And it's obviously going to, you know, has delayed things and is exhausting precious and limited resources unnecessarily. Um, We're we're still running down the track um, to have these rules out in, in the way that they need to be out, education in advance, and then implemented um, you know, by the program effective date. Unless the FTC says something differently, um, that would ultimately be our hope. Now, now obviously, you know, the reliance in, uh, on the state racing commissions now, who you know, the July date is in the middle of the racing season and middle of state budget. So, so hopefully they're going to continue to do the good work in the places where good work is happening. Um, through the end of the season where we can, you know, have more time to, to fully ramp up the elements that need to be rolled out immediately. And I think as Tessa said earlier, you know, we don't expect whether it's whereabouts or other parts of the program that we think, you know, meet the gold standard. Those, those are 18 to 24 months from that July 1 effective date before they're fully implemented and, and having some chance to, to take effect. Travis, speaking of racing commissions, um, I would imagine that not all of them are your best friends. Uh, once you guys come in, they're going to have less power, less authority. 
you might even cost a few people their jobs because there'll be less responsibilities for a racing commission. Uh, knowing that you need their cooperation uh, and need it very badly to get all this working, um, you know, what kind of feedback have you gotten and, and do you see any of this being a problem? So uh, part of obviously the discussions we've been having recently and um, with the authority as well is, is having calls with the state racing commissions. They've obviously got a lot of questions for us. Um, some of them, we you know, we still can't answer. We're still working through a lot of those things. Uh, but I think it's really important to have those dialogues and to sort of be aware and cognizant of the potential challenges. And some of them are sort of um, challenges in all of the states and some of the challenges will be state specific. So we're working through those. And I think we're really hopeful that um, we will looking to the, you know, looking to the future and looking to the, to the sport being successful, work together and collaborate um, with as many of the current infrastructures as possible within those state racing commissions you know, some of them are doing a, a really great job and um, we want to continue to, um, you know, work with with those people and, and the things that are working well. Um, of course, there may be, as you say, people who who um, don't don't agree with it. And if that if that's the case, then we will have to also obviously um, work with that and, um, you know, work out how we do things in those particular uh, states as well. So, yeah, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of further discussions to have. Uh, people to you know talk to those communication channels need to stay open so that we can address the challenges as they come up and you know getting these rules and getting feedback from people now is important and then you know looking at the implementation and how we how we roll these rules out and how we get to July 1 but then from July 1 how we get on you know that 18 24 month uh, period after that and, and uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> Your question reminded me how, how my wonderful wife and, and three great kids always remind me how impatient I am at every moment. Like I, I was, re- we were ready for this January one, you know, twenty twenty one, and and it's been hard um, not to be where we want to be to to roll this out. Um, but we're going to continue to work through. There's obviously, you know, big challenges. Um, part is related to the state racing commissions and, and relying on them, you know, through next season in large part to do the race day testing that they're currently doing and, and collab, you know, working closely with them to make sure that this program is implemented as soon as it possibly can and in a really effective way. And, and I'm hopeful while, you know, it's easy to say, you know, they're not, into, you know, looking forward to this process. I would hope, and, and we have heard from many of them, you know, their frustrations you know, when their state they feel like is doing a really good job and they see, you know, other states not doing a great job, it tears down the integrity of the whole sport. And so we're hopeful that, you know, all ships are going to rise with the tides and, you know, those that otherwise ha- have wanted to do a good job and have fought hard to do a good job. Finally, there's this legislation that allows, you know, all that good work to go into effect in, in a real and robust way. Finally. And guys, I just have one more question for you both. Um, you know, you put together this the, the draft and all the different timetables and schedules and rules and regulations, and I'm sure it was just just a daunting task. What was individually your favorite sections of the rules, and what was the most difficult? Where you, you were like, I can't get my head around this. This industry is so backwards. This I, I don't know what to do. So, what was your favorite part, and what was the most difficult part? So let let me say first, I think what you said about, you know, the, you know, robustness and the daunting, I think was the term you use. It it, it, it can be, particularly if you're not, you know, familiar with the rulemaking process. But I don't think that needs to affect how you see this program, because I think it really boils down if you're, you know, in the sport, trainer, owner, vet, it really boils down to three simple points to be successful in this um, program number one is don't do drugs or give drugs to your to your equine athlete. Number two, if your equine athlete, your horse really needs a genuine, legitimate medication, just check the list or pick up the phone. If we're running the program, call us and we'll have also an online option for that if we're running the program. And then number three, when the whereabouts program is out, just simply provide the location of your horse and have them available for testing out of competition when we come to test them. So I really do think it is that simple. 
um, to live successfully under under this program. You know, the most frustrating, and then we'll go. The most frustrating to me was just this this blurred um, line between what we talked about earlier, the medication control, which in some cases is the abuse or the misuse of drugs, and the industry not seeing that um, as as doping and wanting to kind of water down and justify. You know, I mentioned the term we heard from industry insiders about vets who have turned into needle jockeys um, and some that don't want to go into the practice because they don't like the level of drugs that are being given to horses that seems to be commonplace. Um, so that that's probably a frustrating view, but it's a view that, you know, we fully appreciate and are hopefully going to um, separate out and, 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 and cause to be better um, um, moving forward. Yeah, that was good. Um, I, you know, I think for me, it's some of it is it can be a challenge because we've got to remember that this is a bit of a transformational change. Um, so, you know, sort of securing the future for the sport, making sure we've still got that social license to operate. And it's really important to go back to that. But my favorite thing about it is probably I think it's it's a huge privilege to be involved in this process and be involved in, you know, making U.S. racing you know, forefront and back on the, you know, the national level of, of, of people loving it. And I think something that I see every day when I walk into the office here, uh, the quote of success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue. And that thing, you know, we've had obviously some really tough hours and some really hard decisions that we're sort of having to grapple with um, on some days. I mean, you know, that that's just a, the nature of, of rulemaking, but really it's it's keeping that sort of that eye on the end, the end goal, the vision of, of what is it we're all here for? We're here for the horse. We're here to keep the horse safe. We're here to make the sport fair for those trainers and owners and people who invest in the sport and love it. And, and the betters and the and the public who come to the races and, and embrace our sport and, and, and come and see these amazing, amazing athletes racing. And for me, that's it's not a specific part of the rules themselves. It's the principle behind what it is we're doing with the rules and what it is we're doing and what that stands for for the sport. Tessa, I could not have said it any better than that. That's a perfect way to wrap up. Travis Tiger, Dr. Tessa Muir, thank you guys so much for coming on. Thank you for, for the time and uh, keep fighting the good fight. We appreciate you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Appreciate it. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guests of the Week, Travis Tiger and Tessa Muir will receive free one-hour tax consultations. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. The TDN Writers Room was brought to you by XBTV. I mean, I, I, I went on and on last week about what a great resource XBTV is for the Breeders' Cup, but really it's a great resource year round. You know, if you're attacking the Saratoga meet or the Del Mar meet, you know, you want to see some two-year-olds, some unraced two-year-olds work out and get a better sense you know, who to watch out for. And, you know, coming up to any big race, really, you can, you can go check out the main contenders breezing and, you know, just, you know, there's a little bit of nuance in workouts that I think you learned when you looked through the XBTV database, 
that you might not necessarily know just looking at the line of workouts on the paper. So I think that that's a great service to horse players and you should definitely go to the XBTV website and check it out. Sign up for a free first account so you can start watching works and improve your handicapping. And this week's XBTV workout of the week is Flightline. We talk about Flightline a lot with West Point. We're so excited to see him in the Malibu later this year. He worked three furlongs and 37 and four on Halloween um, last weekend. So check out the flight line work as I'm, I'm sure it's playing right now as I'm talking in your face. And, uh, you know, there's uh, probably a lot of flight line works to come. He's going to have a long run up to that Malibu race. And, and we're excited to see every single one of them. Um, so he's a super exciting horse. And XBTV brings you to the morning workouts better than any other possible resource you could come up with in racing. Okay, so we're just going to do a little uh, a little reaction piece here to the Breeders' Cup races. We're not going to go through all 14 races like we did in the preview show because we're going to take it easy on the listeners and the viewers. We, we were amazed at how many people actually watched that show because of how long it was. But the main two races we'll start with are the Classic and Distaff. We all said before the weekend that those were the two marquee races in terms of deciding championships. Um, we'll have a couple other thoughts maybe throughout the, the, the two days, but we're not going to go through everything. The classic, honestly, to me, left a pretty sour taste in my mouth. Uh, and it was mainly because of the way they were just, they just let Knicks go, go. You know, if you watch the way Medina Spirit was run, John Velasquez had a hold of him. And I saw some conspiracy theories, you know, even a t- guy on TVG was saying that, you know, the, there was like a gentleman's agreement between Johnny and and Joel. I don't really believe that, but it was a little bit obnoxious. I thought the way that race was run because it was over a quarter mile into the race. We wanted to see this big battle and to have the closers have a chance and for it to be a really, a real deciding classic. And really it was over a quarter mile into the race. Nick's goal was never going to lose. Once he got loose like that, there were 23 and change quarter going down a straightaway. And listen, he's had a great year. He's going to be a deserving horse of the year. He's going to be a deserving champion, older male. Um, But I just, we wanted to see a little bit more of a clash, I think, early and late. And to have have him actually have to eyeball somebody. That was the main thing, is he's just such a different horse when someone actually looks him in the eye and forces him to dig down. And I honestly wanted to see that. And so that was very disappointing. And it seemed like kind of maybe an overreaction to the distaff because the distaff was such a suicidal pace that I don't know, like whether they were, you know, Johnny was riding for second or whatever. He did get second with Medina spirit. So if that was the case and it worked out, um, but you know, in the distaff, they, they really just cooked each other. You hardly ever see 21 and 44 for a nine for a long race. And that race obviously completely fell apart late. It was cool to see the Japanese horse get the photo. That was a very exciting finish. And, and that was another subplot of the Breeders' Cup with Japan, not getting not just one, but two Breeders' Cup winners, um, you know, getting the first one and then the second one an hour or two later. Uh, so that was my that was my takeaway is that, you know, Nick's go nothing t- take nothing away from him from him deserving horse of the year. He ran a bunch of big races, but I wanted to see more of a battle in the classic. What do you guys think? Yeah, Joe, it's funny. I was driving in uh, Saturday morning in New York City. I was listening to an interview with John Velasquez and it was about how oh, he's going to go with Medina Spirit. He knew all along what a good horse this was, but he wasn't really able to show it until they got aggressive with him early. He's not going to take back. You're right. This this race was over three jumps out of the gate. And I said on the preview show, I said that John Velasquez will decide this race because Art Collector and Hot Rod Charlie have speed, but they weren't the ones that were going to go after uh, Nick's go. If it was going to be anybody as Medina Spirit. And you're right. When he didn't go after him, when Medina Spirit got a length, length and a half in front and 23 in the first quarter, uh, there's still um, a mile to go in the race. The race was absolutely over. So it was very anticlimactic. But in, in fairness to Velasquez, you know, what if he had gone with Nick's go? And they went 22 flat for the first quarter. Then after it's over, everybody says, well, what was he doing? He got into a suicidal speed duel. Here it was, the distaff all over again. So he was kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. And, uh, you know, I don't know if he did the right thing or not. He got second. It was a very, you know, a dull race. It it really didn't have any excitement to it or anything like that. Another thing that was interesting is um, I guess the betters were thinking, all along the lines of there is going to be some sort of pace battle here and it's going to cost Nick's go. How did he pay three to one, 840 in there when uh, essentially he looked like the, you know, obvious favor in there and essential quality went off at the nine to five favorite. So uh, yeah, but you know, Nick's go take nothing away from him. This is a very good horse. 
He's had a tremendous year. He won horse of the year, showed up when it mattered. And, you know, congratulations to the connections. Something that was really surprising to me, and that was, you know, that essential quality was the favorite. Um, you know, when I was making my picks, I thought I was being cute by going, you know, counter to the, you know, Nick's go because I thought, well, he's going to be six to five. Um, so let me go ahead with, you know, with the three-year-old and, and see if I can, uh, you know, sneak in there and, 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 and win. So when he was, you know, when central quality was going off as the favorite, I was scratching my head as well. Um, it seemed like there were a lot of people that were jumping off the Nick's go bandwagon. And, and, and I understand why, I mean, I was looking for reasons to beat him as well in the race. Um, but hats off, you know, he, he went to the front. He forced the issue. Joe, we talk all the time about jockeys that need to force the issue. When you have the best horse in the race, you get them out in front or you keep them clear. And that's, that's what happened. What I think it does though, is it opens up at least a conversation for us and other pundits to talk about who's going to be three-year-old champion, because there's a lot of talk on, on social media right now about, Hey, Medina spirit beat essential quality. And therefore, you know, he should be considered three-year-old champion. There's a lot of talk that, hey, Essential Quality did everything that he needed to do um, and just came up a little short in two races. One was the Derby and one was the uh, and, and one was, you know, the uh, the Breeders' Cup Classic. Um, and, you know, he should therefore be three year old of the year. I would make a case and an argument that life is good should be three year old, uh, you know, champ based on what he did. Um, again, I think visually. That was the most impressive Breeders' Cup race out of the 14 in, in my eyes was life is good um, winning the race that, that he did. Um, and I really feel like that he should be, you know, in great consideration for three year old champion, even though he had less of a resume as far as less number of races. Um, he was explosive in just about every single one of his races, including um, the Breeders' Cup, the, uh, the, the big ass uh, mile. Um, and Bill, by the way, just just for just for giggles. I went ahead and and because I was bored yesterday in between races and I put the big ass fan into Google Translate and I translated it into Greek and I translated it into Japanese and I translated it back into English and it came back as the sizable donkey club. So <laughs> next year we'll have to make shirts for the sizable donkey club mile. Um that's what this is the stuff that John can only John can bring to this show. And it's because he needs it's because he needs another hobby in his life. <laughs> um, so just to touch on, on the three-year-old horse of the year, three-year-old champion discussion, I, to me, that's insane. I don't know why people were talking about this. Essential quality won the Belmont right. and the Travers Medina spirit won the Derby and then tested positive for, right. uh, for, uh, for a ban, not a banned substance, but above all, the, the threshold for a legal substance. And <laughs> the difference in the classic was three quarters of a length and Medina spirit had that easy trip just stuck in the base and such a quality was way back. He was basically the only horse in the race to make up any ground. So if you're saying that that three quarters of a length should upend the entire year of what essential quality has done, Medina spirit was a wall for most of the spring and summer after the Derby essential quality, won the Jim dandy, he won the Belmont, he won the Travers. Like, I, I don't know what more he could have done during the summer while Medina spirit was licking his wounds, no pun intended from the Derby. Uh, so I, so I think that's a little crazy and, you know, pound for pound, I do think that there's a case to be made that life is good is the best three-year-old in the country. I just think resume wise, he missed too much time. He didn't win the Allen Jerkins as great as he ran and he won the Kelso against the total layup field. And then he, he won on Saturday. So, well, I agree that he is maybe the most impressive three-year-old in the land. I just think, you know, it's 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 a slam dunk three year old championship for essential quality. What do you think, Bill? John, I don't think it's a slam dunk, but I will vote for him. A couple things first. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I do think life is good as the best three year old. But uh, John, his just like Joe said, his body of work wasn't enough. That was his only grade one win of the year. And uh, but the thing that's interesting about Medina Spirit is what do you do with the Kentucky Derby? Now, I'm with you, Joe. Even if you give Medina Spirit credit for the Kentucky Derby, I think essential quality's credentials are better, but it's close. And also remember that they ran against each other twice and both times Medina Spirit finished in front of essential quality. So I think the people that are making a case for uh, Medina Spirit are not totally uh, you know, coming out of left field with this. But, you know, if a voter likes Medina Spirit, I guess you got to say that the Kentucky Derby counts. And I, I'm OK with that, because as we speak here on November 7th or when your vote is going to be cast 
uh, you know, closer to uh, the middle of December or whatnot, it, it's he's still officially the winner of the Kentucky Derby. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So I want to get through some of the other takeaways from the weekend. You know, the 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 big, unfortunately, one of the biggest stories of the weekend was what happened in the juvenile turf with the late scratch. So we're going to talk about that, the whole thing with modern games and that controversy after the next break. But just wanted to get through some of the other uh, on track observations from the weekend. You know, John mentioned life is good. That was, you know, that was honestly the most impressive race of the weekend for me. And it's not as if it was like Nick's go where everyone decided, you know, once the gate opened or a little bit before that to grab and let the horse who everybody knows is impossible to beat when he gets on a loose lead, go on a loose lead. This was a race where life is good. Had to out sprint Jasper Prince to the lead. There were other horses who tried to get the front in that race and he just out sprinted them cooked along the lead on 21 and four, 44 and change and really just dominated in the stretch. And I thought, you know, like John was saying, you know, pound for pound, he might be the best three-year-old in the country. And, you know, supposedly he's coming back next year for the Pegasus and the, and the Saudi cup perhaps. Uh, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see how much he can stretch out that speed. Uh, hopefully he has like a robust, robust four-year-old campaign. I'm going to like, I'm going to hold my breath a little bit on that one because I, you know, I've seen horses be as great as him and, and, you know, minor thing comes up and they, they don't, you don't see them much again, but hopefully he'll come back and have a good four-year-old campaign because he's a super, super exciting animal. We talked about golden pal, obviously a very brilliant turf sprinter. Uh, it'll be good to see him as a four-year-old as well. Uh, as far as the two-year-old races, honestly, I was not, I was not that impressed with either of the dirt winners. I know that that might be a little bit of a controversial opinion, Again, I thought they both had a very easy time of it. You know, the problem with having a six horse field in in the juvenile Phillies is that once Juju's map and hidden connection didn't get out of the gate again, the race was over. The race was over. As soon as the only two horses that could beat Echo Zulu didn't get out of the gate, they might as well have just wrapped it up and walked Echo Zulu over to the winner's circle like that. That to me was one of the most disappointing things of the weekend is how many races were over basically before they even started. And uh, the other one I would mention, uh, well, the Japanese horses too. Love, Love's Only You was a great, great story. And it was a really exciting finish with getting a late split between horses to get up and give Japan its first Breeders' Cup winner. But the other one I got to mention is is poor John's Gamin did not get it done on Saturday. John didn't watch the race, by the way. Not to tell tales out of school here, but I texted him condolences and he said, what? What what happened? You weren't even watching Gamin. How dare you? I thought you were talking about the day before with Coinage. I was like, what what happened? And, no, the, and the other reason why I was the other reason why I was surprised about it is because you were like condolences, and I was like, oh, Gamin didn't win. And then I was like, wait a second, the horse that we said if Gamin gets into speed duel, CC's going to win, did win. So I was like, well, wait a second. So we were kind of half pregnant on that. We were kind of half right. I mean, I was on I was on Edgeway, and I should have had that exact because uh, Edgeway ran second at, at, at sixteen right. to one. Um, but yeah, I mean, we said all year that Gamin did not quite seem like the same horse that she was as a three year old. That bore out to be true. You know, she did she definitely did get pace pressure, but come on, it was a five horse field. Like if she was you know, if she was still that same champion that she was last year, she's supposed to beat those horses no matter what. Um, so that that was disappointing, and I'm, I'm, I guess is we won't see too much of her anymore. She still has had a great career. You know, she's nine, no disgrace being nine for eleven on the racetrack, um, but she she did seem a little bit vulnerable on paper, and that ended up working out to be the case. Just any other takeaways from the weekend's races, Bill? Yeah, I think we could say some of the same things about uh, Jackie's Warriors we said about Gamin. Uh, I mean, he faced a tougher field than Gamin did, but he really had absolutely no excuse. And and I don't remember what, what everybody said uh, in the previous show, but I think we're all uh, in agreement that you know, this is probably the most likely winner of the entire Breeders' Cup uh, through, through the two days. Um, you know, the pace was fast, but it wasn't so fast that it should have done in a horse that was as, if he was as good as we thought he would. Now, maybe he just had a bad day. Uh, we'll see. And also, by the way, the sprint uh, championship is kind of interesting. Um, as much as we love Jackie's Warriors, he's only won one grade one this year. So, you know, I think he'll probably still get it. But Dr. Shivel or Shivel or whatever heck you want to call him uh, is has made a case for that as well. And then going back to uh, the Friday races, I mean, we've got an ongoing story here that's going to be very interesting. What are the owners going to do with Corniche? Gets no points for winning this race. That's okay. Because, you know, during his three-year-old year, there's plenty of points out there that he can pick up. But I can't imagine they possibly stick with Baffert unless something happens that Baffert gets this overturned. And it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So, you know, at some point, when do they say, Bob, 
we got to go someplace else. Do they do it right away with a three-year-old year? Uh, do they do it coming up to the last prep, you know, the big hundred uh, points races? Or do they show unbelievably unbelievable loyalty to Baffert and say, we're just going to go for the Preakness? I, I don't think that's going to happen. But that that's something that, uh, you know, is really going to be interesting to see how that plays out. You guys brought up some excellent points. Uh, a couple more just to uh, put a bow on, on this year's uh, Breeders' Cup weekend. Um, first of all, hats off to the Breeders' Cup and to Del Mar um, for doing just an outstanding job, getting everything coordinated, getting everything together. Um, and also, I thought the TV coverage was really good this year. Um, you know, they, they had a ton of, of footage and, a, and a, you know, behind the scenes and jockey cams and paddock cams. And, you know, just it, it really lent itself to like a real sporting event. Um, you know, which is, I think, the first time in, in you know, maybe ever that uh, horse racing series actually had, you know, the, the, the real coverage like it was a baseball game or a football game. It was it was really intriguing to me. Um, no injuries, no injuries, no horses getting hurt, no jockeys getting hurt, nobody clipping heels. Um, you know, really, we look at, at, at you know, just uh, in the timeline about two years ago. And, and Bill, I remember we talked about this off air that that California racing was, you know, was on life support. I mean, there was a lot of political um, you know, pressure to get rid of racing, horse racing in California. And here just two years later, um, they had, you know, one of the strongest um, Breeders' Cup, uh, you know, weekends that, that we can remember. And they had an almost pristine safety record for their race meets as well, um, you know, which is outstanding. So, you know, again, hats off to, um, to, to those outfits. You know, we mentioned some of the great races. Life is good. Um, Love's Only You was just shot out of a cannon midway down the stretch. And that was after running 10 and a half furlongs and still had to kick at the end to go between horses, Not, you know, which, which was really amazing to me. Um, Echo Zulu remaining undefeated. Golden Pal, I did Pal. I just had a wow next to next to the race because it was just the race was over two steps out of the gate. Maryland breads. How about, you know, we're known for football and crab cakes, but also now for two Breeders' Cup champions, uh, you know, with Nick's Go and Aloha West, um, which I thought was really, really cool. Japan breaking through was was excellent. So, again, hats off to them. And, and actually, speaking of hats, how about the purple fedora? I mean, if you're going to go to a race, you know, wearing a purple fedora, you know you're loaded for bear. So, again, congratulations to Japan for winning not one but two Breeders' Cups, getting off the schneid and, and, and winning a couple of them. But, you know, loves only you, um, you know, to be able to sport that Prince Fedora was really, really stout in my mind. That was impressive. Let me just add one more thing, because I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say it. Charlie Appleby. Yeah. Is this guy yeah. unbelievable or what? He won nine stakes races in the U.S. this year. Uh, they were either all grade ones or that race at, at Belmont that is eventually going to be a grade one. And he only entered in 14 races, yeah. nine wins out of 14. And this might be crazy, but I have some thoughts that maybe he should be trainer of the year. Yeah, for, I was just thinking that. Yeah, we're going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. if there was ever a guy who only ran 14 times in yeah, America. Exactly. And should get champion trainer votes. He's the he's that guy. And, yeah, and including three Breeders' Cup wins. I mean, it's just right. unbelievable what this guy did. And and yeah. that and that's with half of his Breeders' Cup entries getting scratched at the gate. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it's true. really, you know, he really had he had more horses that that were that were loaded and ready to go. Um, literally loaded in the gate and ready to go, and uh, and and didn't make it out of the gate. Um, you know, for the race. But no, Bill, you're you're right. I mean, as far as since we're since we're picking horses that have short resumes as horse of the year and, and, you know, three-year-old of the year. Um, it's not unthinkable to, 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 to offer up, you know, Charlie Appleby saying, I know he's got a short resume here in the States, but he's got to be in consideration for one of the top three. Yeah. Brad, well, Brad Cox is going to win, but I would, I would agree that Charlie Appleby should get some, should get some votes because you want to talk about the impact at the grade one level in America this year. He was right up there with anybody with a very limited number of starters. And that was really, that was wild to see him twice get one of those horses scratched at the gate and then watch the other one go on and win. The other right. thing with the, the Bob Baffert storyline, you know, I felt like his horses ran about how you would expect, you know, we thought Gamine was a little vulnerable. You want to say that she disappointed, you know, I can agree with you there. Corniche still won. You know, he didn't have that many starters. That was the whole thing was that you would expect Bob Baffert usually to have more, maybe like a dozen 15 starters in the Breeders' Cup. He only had a handful 
private mission, as you would expect, ran up the track after dueling on that suicidal pace. Um, I just, you know, overall, I think his horses performed about up to par, which I guess is a, is, you know, a feather in his cap with all the extra scrutiny that that he was going through. But yeah, that's going to be a, that's going to be an interesting subplot going forward is to see where Corniche and maybe some of his other top two-year-olds end up because there's just no way, there's no way anybody is that loyal to Bob Baffert that they have a potential derby horse and they're going to skip the derby to run in the Preakness just to keep Bob Baffert in, in their good graces. It's just, it's not going to happen, buddy. So we're going to keep an eye on that going forward as well. And, and Joe, he, the owner even alluded to that when they interviewed him, it was, they were literally standing in the mirror school holding onto the trophy. And they asked him a question about Baffert and all he's, all he would commit to is Bob's done a great job with this horse, but we'll have to see. I mean, that that's telling. I mean, you're, you're, you're on the stage, you're literally receiving the trophy for a horse that won the Breeders' Cup and you're not willing to say like, he's my man. <laughs> right under the bus, right under the bus. Like you did a good job. Now I'm going to hand it off to somebody else who can get me to the Derby. And it's reasonable. Like he put himself in that position. It's not the owner's fault. Bob Baffert put himself in that position. Sorry. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. And there's plenty of stakes action over the weekend for West Point at the Breeders' Cup. Giant Gang ran a big race in the Juvenile to finish third, trained by Dale Romans, son of uh, Giants Causeway, will be definitely a horse to watch next year. As a three-year-old, um, and he also had a winner at Churchill Downs over the weekend with Shadow Matter winning an allowance optional claiming spot for uh, Dallas Stewart. Three-year-old Col- Colt is owned in partnership with Pearl Racing, so congratulations to the partners and a big, big placing in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile with uh, Giant Games. And congratulations to you guys there as well. So we'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills, fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Now more than ever, it's time to get with the program because New York Reds start with an advantage. New York Reds run for Serious Green. At Belmont and Saratoga, New York Red Maidens run for up to $75,000 and allowance horses for up to $85,000. And serious New York Red owners can collect awards of up to $20,000 per horse per race in open company. So get back with the program. Seriously. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the New York Thoroughbred Breeding and Development Fund. We had a big retirement last week in the New York bread world. Mr. Buff, who was a very, very popular New York bread, retired last week after a 17 win career. I love Mr. Buff. Yeah, he, first of all, he retired with two New York bread championships. He won older dirt mail in 2019, in 2019 and 2020 in six seasons on the track. He won 11 stakes and made every start, but two in New York. Mr. Buff was a real New York war horse. You talk about a horse, and then he wasn't like one of these horses that you know went to Gulfstream or went a, you know went away for the winter. He would run in all those races during the winter, like the Damon Runyon and all these races that used to be run on the inner track at Aqueduct. That's no longer a thing, but he would run all through the winter and was just such a hard knocking horse and a, a very very admirable horse for John Kimmel. Obviously made a bunch of money in those New York bred stakes and really he you know he could compete in Open Company too, but they really they found his niche as like a New York bred speedy dirt router and you know he he'll be missed but he's definitely definitely earned his retirement so so salute to the connections of, of mr buff um and, and and best of luck to him and his, his his the rest of his life and uh also son of thunder retired to waldorf form it's the son of uncle mo who's a full brother to lao man who was a very good early you know first or second crop sire and, uh, until he unfortunately passed away um but that's that's a big like, like i said to have those sons of uncle mo and these you know, major, major superstar stallions start to populate the New York breeding program, I think is a big deal to have those families represented in the New York breads, New York bread programs was another son of uncle Mo. We talked about Galilean before it was son of uncle Mo, who is now coming to to New York to stand in New York. So that's a big deal as well. Um, John, do you have any thoughts about the, the quality of the New York bread program? Yeah. Don't forget, 
don't forget probably one of the most timely uh, you know, bullet points or talking points that we should include, which is if you buy a mare at one of the upcoming breeding uh, sales, whether it's, you know, Phasic or Keeneland, you buy a mare for $50,000 or more, regardless of where it's spent, uh, where she spent her time, she can be considered a resident New York mare if you bring her right from the sales grounds up to New York. Um, so it's a huge advantage, especially with, with all of these better bred um, stallions that are now popping up in New York. So, um, you know, if you're going to buy a mare at one of the upcoming sales for $50,000 or more, you can move that mare and uh, in utero fall to New York, pop out a New York bread and start taking advantage of all the uh, benefits of, of having New York breads. So we, got, we have to talk about this. We have to talk about what happened with the juvenile turf on Friday at Del Mar. And you know, to me, it doesn't overshadow the weekend because there was too much good racing. And, you know, like John mentioned earlier, I think one of the one of the best stories was that no injuries, no, no controversy in that way. Even the horses that flipped in the gate were OK. That was the main thing, because, you know, hey, you have that many horses running and training. And, you know, it's it's it definitely is is is, is, is a potential for some kind of terrible story in that way. So we were glad we got through that. And Del Mar has, has a very good safety record. So, you know, I, I think they've earned you know, to be in that rotation for the Breeders' Cup. However, on Friday, this was an absolute disaster. If you didn't watch or if you were, were only caught like the, the you know, cliff notes of what happened, in the juvenile turf, they were loading uh, and Charlie Appleby had two horses on the inside post. One, The number one was Modern Games. The, the two was Albar. Now, both acted up in the gate, but Albar acted up way worse flipped and to the point where he was sitting on his butt in the gate, very, very scary situation where his legs were dangling over the top of the gate for a little bit. Um, thankfully he was okay. They backed him out. He jogged back to the barn. Uh, Charlie Appleby reported that he just had a couple of, you know, superficial scratches on him and he's, he's going to be fine. So that's the most important thing. But then modern games was backed out of the gate and scratched by the, by the vet until about five minutes later, they decided Actually, he's fine. Let's let's let him run. Let me just read you read you the sequence of events. And this is from the CHRB advisory. So I, I got to give them at least a little bit of credit for releasing this and having a little bit of transparency. I'll just read this to you. Uh, OK, the CHRB determined that, as discussed in the aftermath of the race, Modern Games was scratched by the stewards on the recommendation of one of the track veterinarians, Dr. Chuck Jenkins, at the starting gate at 535 and 35 seconds Pacific time. After additional examination and assessment of modern games by the attending veterinary team, track veterinarian Dr. Dana Stead concluded that the horse had not been injured and communicated to the stewards that the horse was cleared to run. This is the, this is the key part right here. Due to a miscommunication between the stewards and the Del Mar Mutuals Department, modern games was reinserted into the paramutual wagering pools at 537.01 Pacific time. At, at 543.49 Pacific time, after it was made clear to the Mutuals Department that Modern Games was competing for purse money only, the horse was again removed from the wagering pools. The race went off four minutes later. And of course, Modern Games won the race. So if you're a better and you had Modern Games, and there were a lot of people because he was a short price, if you had a pick four closing to him or a pick three closing to him, at least if you had a win bet or a, an intra race bet, you get your money back. If you had a horizontal wager, your wager went to the post-time favorite who did not win the race. So you essentially got your money taken from you. And it was the, the problem to me, there's a lot of problems with this. First of all, the terrible communication, the ridiculous like clown car that is racing in terms of communication between the stewards and the track management and the mutuals department. It was just complete nonsense. But the main thing to me is if the horse can be scratched by the, by the veterinarian and then reinserted into the race, and then the horse can be reinserted into the pools. Why is the horse then going to run for purse money only? That was the that was the uh, that was the determination. They had to run for purse money only because the horse was scratched initially. You've seen this sometimes before. Sometimes usually it's early scratches. They'll report early scratches. There'll be a mistake, and they'll say the horse has to run for purse money only because he can't be reinserted in the pools. This horse was reinserted into the pool, so it wasn't a technology thing. It wasn't as if they could not put the horse back into the pools. They just decided to have the horse run for purse money only because that's the law of the land. And it just makes no sense. And it just continues a pattern of thinking of the betters last after everybody. The people who actually fund the game and who the, who the game would not exist without them are thought of absolutely last in terms of connections, in terms of the track. They don't like it just. 
people are fed up of feeling like stepped on and disrespected as, as people who, who fund the game. And I know I got a lot more to say about this, but I, I've been going on for a little bit, but Bill, you must have some thoughts about this. Yeah, no? I mean, yeah, there's not a whole much more to add. And, and, you know, you touched on the major problem here is the gamblers in here. And the worst part of it was, you know, at least if you bet on the horse to win, you got your money back, but you know, people that had him in the pick five, pick four, et cetera, not only did they not get their money back, they turned, they have, imagine this, you, you bet a winner and you lose your money. I, I mean, huh? That, that's actually what happened here. I, I think that the conclusion was that, you know, there was just too many people involved in the process. You know, this vet looking at this horse and this vet's going to scratch him and this other vet's not going to. I think the Breeders' Cup learned a lesson and they said afterwards that, that I forget what, which of the vet, maybe the second one, the guy who uh, said he was OK, was going to be the only one that could determine uh, who would who would uh, determine whether or not a horse was was to be scratched before the race. But, yeah, I mean, you know what? chaos, embarrassment, um, you know, clown car, you know, and normally the Breeders' Cup is a very well-run event. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm surprised that they screwed this up so badly. And, you know, we need people to love this game. We need people to have fun with it. We need people to think they've got to, if you're a gambler, you know, you're going to lose your money, but at least you want to think that you got a fighting chance. And this happens to you. You're just like, well, you know, why am I bothering with this? And, and this reminded me of, of a baseball game, uh, and Bill, you'll appreciate this analogy where, you know, they pinch hit for, for uh, you know, for a defensive shortstop and, uh, and, and they tie the game up. And then the guy who pinch hit for the defensive shortstop has to go out and play shortstop. And of course, and, and, and you know, basically can't feel the, uh, you know, a grounder. And of course, the ball finds that guy. Um, this was the weak spot. Obviously, in the entire, um, you know, rules and regulatory situation for, you know, for the racing, they handled all the safety issues, they handled all of the veterinary issues, um, and, and which, again, kudos to them for doing all those things. Um, but when it came down to this it was a cluster. I mean, it was a complete cluster, not only for the betters. I mean, and, and first and foremost, um, you know, you feel bad for them. I don't know what system would work. Uh, you know, people have, have discussed, you know, have, have complained about, well, my horse scratched, so I get the wagering favorite. I, I don't know what else they want them to do um, as far as, you know, pick a horse for them, or they're not going to give them more time to reassess the race and, and you know, give them another 15 minutes to, to make decisions. But be that as it may, you know, the system is the way it's set up. The problem also, aside from the betters, you know, have a legitimate complaint is that ironically enough, this was the worst race that could happen to. It was the last race with a bunch of two-year-old Colts, um, you know, running in the race. They had 12 of the 14 horses loaded in the gate. We actually were number 13 and we're just about in the gate when all of this happened. So they had to back everybody else out. Well, then it took another 10 to 15 minutes, depending on, on which clock you're using, um, you know, before the horses could get back in the gate and then start again. And, and again, as an owner of a horse in the race, that wasn't the reason why we lost. OK, did it help our cause? No, we have a hot blooded tappet cult and he was starting to, to, to get hot and sweat. And his mental focus was like out the out the window as soon as they, they had him halfway into the stall at the gate and backed him out. But there were a lot of other horses that it affected also in the race that ran kind of substandard. Um, and again, were we, were we going to win the race? Probably not. But it didn't help. What it did do is it did help the very cool, calm and collected modern games who basically, you know, got kicked and still was able to run and run a very impressive race after all of that. So I think that that they're finding the stress test of this situation. And I'm hoping that um, whether it's California Racing or, and or the Breeders' Cup are going to change the rule to make it more streamlined. Um, but I think this stress test, they obviously failed. And, uh, and, and if nothing else, hopefully it'll beget better results going forward. And, you know, like Bill said, there, I think there are too many cooks in the kitchen in, in these kind of scenarios. And it just, you get the impression that they're just making this stuff up as they go along. And that is not, that, that is not what major sports do. And I, I tweeted at this is at the time, but like, do any other sports routinely embarrass 
and befuddle and leave their leave their fans and their customers dumbfounded like this on the biggest stages. Like I think back to two years ago, the Kentucky Derby with the 22 minute disqualification of maximum security and then answering no questions about it, reading a 30 second statement like how many how many clowns have to be exposed in racing before we actually get it together and treat the betting public for what they are, which is the engine of the sport. We still do not do that as a sport. And it's, you know, like John said, you know, with all the safety stuff going on, that's the hard part. That theoretically should be the hard part, trying to keep all the horses and all the riders safe and the things you have to cross your fingers for. This should be the easy part to not screw over the betters in such a ridiculous way that anybody who has any concept whatsoever of paramutual wagering can say, what are you guys doing? This is, this is a ridiculous clown show to me. I mean, you know, in terms of fixes, you, like you said, you got, you, you have to streamline this stuff. The, 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 the one vet was like, scratch him. And then a couple of minutes later, the other vet was like, actually he's good. And then they reinserted the horse into the pools and then took him out again. That to me is the worst part. It's not as if they scratched the horse initially and they were like, well, there's nothing we can do now. The horse has been scratched. They put the horse back into the pools and then scratched him again. Like, why? Why? What? what you know, what is the purpose of something like that that is just going to enrage your customers so much? You can talk about the rules and about how it had to be, you know, you know, they got the purse money only rule. That's a fix that I think we need to make. Get rid of the rule. Get rid of that purse money only rule. Because it just leaves such a bad taste in people's mouths, and it happens in you know in racing all the time in New York where they have entries, and one part of an entry scratches, and then the other part runs for purse money only. Why? Why does that have to be the case? I get the idea that you know if you liked one half of the entry and that's the half that scratches, you're stuck with the other. Like that that happens a couple times a year. Too bad. It seems to happen more often that the other part of the entry wins, and you get absolutely nothing for it. And the only time where it makes sense, honestly, to do something like that is if, say, the horse threw a shoe in the paddock and the trainer's like, oh, I'm going to run him anyway. Then it makes sense to protect the better and be like, well, this is an impediment to this horse. The trainer's deciding to run him anyway. The better did not have an, 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 uh, an, an uh, they had no opportunity to, you know, analyze that information when they made the bet. Then you run for purse money only. All this other arcane, ridiculous nonsense running for purse money only just because the horse was you know, mistakenly scratched needs to go because this cannot happen on the rate on any stage, but especially on racing's biggest stage, this absolutely cannot happen. And people have a right to be outraged at the Breeders' Cup and at Del Mar this weekend because, you know, uh, from an otherwise, you know, pretty much impeccable racing production, this was a major, major black eye and we're tired of it. People who bet on this game are tired of being slapped in the face and treated like they don't matter when they should matter more than anybody else. The owners got to run their horse. Godolphin got to cash that check. Charlie Appleby got a second chance of running. He got to cash that check. The betters who were alive to modern games got kicked in the nuts and they have to walk out the door and be expected to come back and bet the next day. It's unacceptable. They actually paid to get kicked in the nuts. Exactly. It's basically exactly. what happened. That's, that, that's pretty much the, the takeaway from all this. And Joe, you, you, you said, I just want to re- reiterate one thing. And that is whenever they, whenever I've seen races where a horse runs for purse money only it is specifically to protect the betters that's exactly why they have the rule and you mentioned you know a horse that that bends a shoe on the way or in the paddock you know getting saddled and they have to pull the shoe off so a horse is running with three shoes well that's exactly why the rule is there to protect the betters from that standpoint um but this was a and and i think the other part of the, the equation as to why it was so you know muddied was that instead of backing out modern games like they did with all the other horses, they opened the front of the gate. So the horse actually galloped out for a couple of strides, you know, out of the front of the gate. And I think that led, I can't, you know, speak for the first vet, but I think that led the first vet to be like, well, it's an automatic scratch at this point in my mind, or I'm leaning towards an automatic scratch because the horse went out the, 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 you know, the front of the gate and therefore probably had to, you know, spend some energy. And on top of it got kicked I'm going to go ahead and scratch the horse. The second vet made the right decision, in my opinion, because the horse won. So obviously the horse was sound and, and doing OK. Um, but but the, the key of all this is you got to protect your fans and your betters, because without them, it's just we're just match racing. And you have to have a process in place that's not. Well, the one vet says this and the other vet says this. Right. So hold on. Let me call the mutuals department, see what they did. And then, wait, did you scratch the horse? No, put the horse back in. Oh, wait, 
No, now these horses running, take them back. Like, guys, there has to be a better process in place in a race where there's tens of millions of dollars of, of gambling money on the line. It's just, you know, for a sport that is the bedrock of the game is betting to treat the betters like they don't matter over and over again. And then you wonder why people walk away. I can't blame them after what happened on Friday. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Legacy Bloodstock will be strongly represented at the Keeneland November sale this week. They have weanlings by First Crop Sire's Catalina Cruiser, Vino Rosso, and uh, Matoli, and have mares in full of the hot young sires like Omaha Beach and Authentic, Tis the Law, and more. They'll kick off the sale at Barn 24, so be sure to stop by if you're on the sales grounds to check out the Legacy consignment. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving them down the road every day. There's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's monumental edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. Keeneland November is going on right now and runs through next Friday, November 19th. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guests of the week, Travis Tiger and Tessa Muir, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. <laughs>